Um, I've asked a few people just to share some specific things. I'm missing Wilbert. Um, that they, maybe their small groups are strong. Is there another group outside somewhere? Do we have all the groups in here? Okay. I've asked a few people just to share on specific things. I'm a, that you guys maybe share about five minutes, and then I can allow a question or two for each one of you. And then, um, then we'll have a little bit of time at the end also if there's a wild question, wild card question. <laughs> um, so we'll start with Duncan. So I've asked Duncan just, or, or not, it's not just me that put this training together, but the, a lot of us that put this training together. We felt to let Duncan share, thank you, Robert, about um, just facilitating your small group to serve in church because they've done that quite well. So, um, yeah, I, I, I love this about our small group. We, when we met we, about a year or two back, um, we didn't have a lot of people serving in church in our small group. And um, we specifically felt that at that stage, our small, small group was, the, the, the purpose of it at that, at that stage was to allow people to, to rest and reconnect with um, God and with each other in, in community. Um, <clears throat> so we just we facilitated that. We we really were intentional about um, community, about doing things together. We often had on a Saturday morning we go and have a breakfast somewhere um, or go for a, a park run together when when we still did that and whatever. Um, but through that, from that time till now, if, if if I look at our small group now, we almost every single person is serving in church, um, and and we were. I was looking at. It, I was like, if if all of our small group decided to leave and start a new church, <laughs> then uh, then we take out a lot of people. That, I mean, that, that are serving here at, on on a Sunday morning. So, to me, that was um, that was. God really activated the people in our small group to serve. Um, one of the things that we, we did to facilitate that as well is that everybody has a chance to, to lead a small group. So, so it's not just the small group leader who takes charge. So Jason and Marianne are the small group leaders, and they're doing an amazing job. Um, and they really take control well. Um, but then we also allow every single person to have a chance to host and to, um, to lead a small group. Um, and that maybe is not practical for, for every type of small group, but just for ours, we, we have a lot of kind of more mature people, and, and it really lended itself to that. And I think that was part of that in the community aspect was um, really helped and, and to, to activate people to, to serve in church. Um, and that's part of leadership development and, and, and mentoring and that, and that type of thing. So... So, so what, what we also instituted in a small group is um, once a month we have a family meal. So we just come and we all bring something and we have a meal together and we just, it's just fellowship. Um, and the other one is once a month we have, well, we try to have once a month intercession. Um, so we pray together, we, we try and worship here and there, but you know, we, we try and do that as well. Um, as part of that, um, and and I think that allows the Holy Spirit to activate people as well. Um, yeah. So. So. <laughs> no, no, no. So. I, we, we did discuss we did discuss beforehand or at the beginning of the year I can't remember which year it was but at the beginning of the year we did we, we we discussed together what is our role and function what does God want to do in our small group and we all prayed about it and, and we came to um, what we felt and and part of it was this exact thing um, and um, yeah so so also there's obviously a fine line between 
you know, not doing anything and, and resting, you know what I mean? Like, we don't want people to become lazy um, because it's, uh, you know, people grow when they serve. Um, so it's, it's managing that. But, but it's, it's like you, we can really see how the Holy Spirit activated people. It wasn't less like, you know, obviously you've got to try and be, um, as, a, as a leader, you've got, to, you've got to be in tune with the Holy Spirit. But it really is the Holy Spirit activating people and giving them a desire to serve in church um, and allowing that platform by them leading. And, and often people don't think that they're leaders, but when you give them an opportunity and a safe space to practice it, they realize, like, like for me, I, when I was at school, um, talking in front of people was my absolute worst thing. I, I, I was terrified of it. And the way that I overcame it was going on missions. So what happened is we would have to talk in front of people. We'd have to give our testimonies. That was the start of it. And this, like, it literally terrified me. And I, rem I remember the exact, it was in Plet, and it was in front of, it was a massive church, about 500 people or so. And something in me, it was obviously the Holy Spirit, something clicked, something changed in me. Um, and that fear of talking in front of people completely disappeared. And I actually found out that I really enjoy doing it. And I became a teacher. So, um, and, and so, so that kind of, that, call it a gifting or whatever, was in me, but I hadn't realized it. But having a safe space to, and allowing the Holy Spirit, and by serving, going on a mission by serving, the Holy Spirit was, God was able to activate that um, or, or change that. And that's also with, you know, with leadership development in your small groups is giving that safe space and allowing people, mentoring them into leading. And, and like I said earlier, sometimes it's not, you don't necessarily, some people don't look like leaders, but they, God has placed it in them. It's just got to be dug up there. Um, and so to provide a, a safe space for that is, is uh, to me important. Sorry, um, you mentioned something about government park runs and having breakfast. So I was just wondering, what was the conversation like when you have supper? Would it be about small group or would it just be about life? Or you know, what would you do in terms of also enabling them to serve at church? But sometimes when you have supper and you have park runs, it can just be fun. So how would you like use that to mobilize people to serve? But that's what the Musenberg guys do. They just serve and... <laughs> Have fun. Oh, that's yeah. it. We on this side of the mountain, we keep the economy going. <laughs> <laughs> um, Trust so fund babies, or I don't know. How <laughs> I get that. Um, I've forgotten what I needed to say now. Thanks, Kenny. No, so I, I, I don't want to take up too too much of the time. But it, if you look at how Jesus, so we didn't specifically when we did that. Sometimes we talk about small group stuff, but other times it's just being together and being in community. If you look at how Jesus raised up the disciples, there was teaching time, but there was also just being together time. And, and just by the disciples observing Jesus and seeing something and then asking him questions or whatever it is, just by being together, that, that was a form of leadership development and mentoring. So, um, you know, all of us just being together and observing, I mean, you know, seeing the craziness of our household with all the kids running around um, and us maybe failing sometimes in our, in our parenting skill or whatever. Pe people can just be together and, and, and um, you know, learn from each other through that, through that whole process and allowing the Holy Spirit to, to, to do that. Okay, I want to ask um, Sifa about um, what are and what I just always see around CFA's life is raising up leaders. 
You want to ask Sifa to maybe speak a bit about raising up leaders? Yeah, so I'm just going to speak from like experience and what I know. <laughs> um, um, but I think the one thing with raising up leaders, I think the first thing is just to really build a relationship with someone. Like if you see that there's someone that you're like, you, I think they're, they're a leader. I think the first thing is to build a relationship with them and something that like being intentional about like praying for that person and like asking God, like, what do you see in this person and being intentional about seeing that and looking and like, even if they tell you like all the issues and the problems, whatnot, but to see what God sees and, um, what has also been really helpful, especially when people are not confident, is to call out the gold in someone, like to be intentional about saying like, this is what I see in you, this is what I see in you. Um, because if they, like when they get to that moment when like now you're telling them, okay, like I'm pushing you out, it's time for you to go. I think they will feel confident, they will feel supported because they know your heart as well and that they, they know like, okay, if Sifa says that I can do it, okay, clearly I can do it and they've already been reminded of that. Um, and I think like from a small group leading perspective, I learned this in School of the Nations, I think many people already know this, but just the whole concept of like, if I'm a small group leader, then like I'm doing the small group leading and then the people in the small group are watching. So it's like, I do, you watch. And then afterwards, if I see that there's someone that I think they should start leading small group, then it's a thing of like, okay, I'm gonna do and you're gonna help me in some way. Like maybe can you just share something small or like share your testimony? Then you're involving them in that leading of small group. So it's like, I do, you help. And then afterwards to allow them the opportunity to also lead, but then you're the one supporting, then it's like, you do, I help. And then afterwards, like the next step is for them to, you do, I watch. And then it gets to a point where you don't actually have to do anything and you can kind of step away as well and let them lead. So I think just having that, I think that whole concept of it, like you can even put it in a timeline for yourself. If there's a specific person that you want like them to start leading small group, you can put that in a timeline of like, okay, this is how long we're going to be doing the I do, you help type of thing, just depending on the person as well. Um, yeah. Uh, just a question with that with that process is it that you speak to the person and say are you interested i want to raise you up kind of thing this is how we're going to do it or is it just in your mind and for your planning that you this week draw them in and ask them to do the testimony next week ask them to do it do you I communicate it, it with them or not shame i think it really depends on the person there's some people who don't know that they're in that process <laughs> But then, like, yeah, eventually when it gets to that stage of, like, um, you do, like, I help, then from there maybe you'd be like, okay, I see this in you. And, and because they've already started doing a little bit of something, they realize that they can actually do it and they have a bit of confidence. So I think within the process, I think you can also just tell them within the process of, like, okay, hey, what do you think about leading small group? Um, So, so how important is personal leadership to you when you're like raising up other leaders? Yeah, I'm asking like, like how much, like if I'm a leader and I want to raise up other leaders, like how, how much personal leadership do I have to have in my own life? Yeah. Just, just like, because I know Sifa is a very aware girl and I know she does a lot of um, um, stuff that you do to yourself in terms of educating yourself, reading books, listening to podcasts, and um, just making sure she's always in a position to give. I mean, she does a lot of work on herself, and I admire that. So I'm just maybe hunting for like secrets what you do. <laughs> I won't lie. Like, I think even like with my relationship with Jesus, I won't lie. Like, it's been like Holy Spirit focused. So I wasn't that type of person that like read a lot of books, read a lot of leadership things. It was just not my thing. And it was kind of like, oh, Holy Spirit, what do you want me to do type of thing? And I think like if you're just walking with Jesus, he's going to lead you to a point where he's going to tell you to raise up other leaders because we're all called to do that. And I think it gets to a point where you, you realize, okay, the way I'm doing this doesn't seem right. I'm getting burnt out. Then you actually have to start getting resources to figure out, okay, what is a new way to do this? I think like within everyone, I think the Holy Spirit has equipped us already. Um, and then for your own self, you can already go look for other things. But like, 
primarily relying on the Holy Spirit is something that I do. Do you have somebody, because obviously you are giving to other people, do you have somebody who's giving into you besides the Holy Spirit? That makes sense? Like people who are supporting me and yeah, I think also as a lead, you have to be intentional about that as well. So I do have like Pastiana and like other people that I know in my community as well, where I remembered for a while I struggled with being like vulnerable and open to people and like the Lord called me out on it. And he was like, you wouldn't have all these problems if you just asked for help. And I was like, oh, okay. So I think also just being intentional and asking the Lord, like, who are my people who are there to support me as well? Like, I think when I think of the story, I think the Israelites were fighting a battle and Moses had to keep his hands up in a sense. Um, he needed, I think it was Aaron and her, right, to support him. But it's crazy to think that like God being God could have literally given Moses the ability to keep his hands up the whole time. But he was like, no, I'm going to get people to support you. And to realize as a leader that you're going to need people to support you as well, even though, yeah. Um, I wanted to mention something small, which you can maybe comment on. It's just in my personal experience, um, also in a journey of raising up other people to, to work in missions or to um, um, eventually also serve in church, a, a challenge that I found for myself and a possible solution that I found was when there are areas in their lives which you know are, I don't know how to say this, maybe uh, like a weakness point or a flaw or something that can be strengthened, what I did find, it, in the beginning, I, I, I was very harsh, and I would be like, hey, this actually has to change. But for some people, it, it's actually just so helpful to, to speak the opposite over them, in front of them, like, oh, you are so patient. Oh, my goodness, wow, I just honor you for being so patient, even if they were, like, really impatient. <laughs> um, but, like, that actually helps because they start believing it. And I don't know if you've got anything if you'd like to add to that for actually taking something that is, is harmful in leadership and helping them steer it to something beautiful or building them up or, um, yeah. Yeah, I think I'll comment it. I think I remembered, like, Matthew was always advising, especially with, like, I think just like with student ministry, people come from different backgrounds. There's a lot of different things that people can struggle with. And, like, I think with also raising up leaders, like, you're not responsible to fix every single thing. But, like, it's that thing of, like, always establishing that relationship with Jesus, calling out the gold in them. And eventually, like, that, those things are going to change by themselves as well. But obviously, like, wisdom with the Holy Spirit, he will tell you when, okay, maybe you need to address this specific thing. But, like, I think in raising up leaders to not just focus on the weaknesses, but to strengthen the strengths, I think. Just want to say, like, that's what I, I don't know if it came across, but that's what I intended with my previous sermon is, um, and that's what I'm saying, like, it's not account disability, it's accountability. Never underestimate encouragement. Encourage, 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 encourage. See what God sees. Um, see the good and, and make it grow. See what God is doing. You know, let's keep our whole culture going forward, outward, on God, positive, hope. What is he doing? What is in this person? What can they already do? Um, what can I call out in them? How can they grow? So I just really agree with that. I kind of have inside information. Like, she was just telling me about, like, how she follows up people and stuff. And I was like, what's, what's like, the... When, when I was listening to you, this is what went to my mind. I was like, yo, this sounds like just, like, automatic reminder to yourself. She has, like, what's this WhatsApp list, like, broadcast list <laughs> for... What, like, how do you find that, like, where, where do you stop being too personal? Does being too personal in your messaging to people when you're leading like a lot of people, does it become a hindrance? And how do you deal with like, you have to message 20 people consistently and still keep doing it effectively? How do you find that balance? Not being too impersonal, but also not letting it drag you down. Yeah, yeah it can be really difficult. Um, but I think, yeah, so sometimes I do broadcast like hello messages <laughs> to everyone at one time. But then after that, keeping the conversation is all personal messages. But what I literally do is I write down everyone's name in a sense. And then it's like, I write like a tick 
if I've messaged the person and then like then I'll write a second tick if like I've scheduled like a coffee day with that person or a phone call and like a third tick next to the name of it's done type of thing because there's a lot of people and then like I'm bad with my phone so after I've messaged you hello and I've gotten like 10 other messages it's at the bottom and I'm gonna see it like two weeks later so just see yeah, I'm making lists is something that I have to do now <laughs> <laughs> so my question is then how often do you uh, pray for your small group I mean as you call out the, the, the leadership in every person do you have a schedule where um, on a Monday you focus on praying for everyone on the list um, so how often do you uh, pray for the people in the small groups that you're leading mm. yes yeah, so I think it has been something it was a bit of a challenge I won't lie in the beginning to to like change my whole life in like terms of being responsible with people. So I won't lie, it has not always been perfect. Um, but I think taking in like certain days sometimes would be very helpful in terms of like, okay, I'm just gonna pray for small groups. And even like splitting them up, like okay, I'm focusing on this specific small group. Okay, I'm gonna pray for individual people. And just like really like engaging with the Holy Spirit. So if I feel like there's a specific person that I need to really, really pray for in that moment, then to go with that. Um, yeah, so I think that's the way I've been doing it. I'll ask Gilbert a question, but then um, uh, the students have been a little bit quiet today. So after Wilbert's question, three students can ask questions. If not, I will select you. <laughs> no one leaves the room now. <laughs> so um, Wilbert, I think the thing that we've wanted you to just share on is um, facilitating relationships. So. One thing is, I think Wilbur's good at building relationships with other people, but also letting other people build relationships with other people. Wow. Wow. Yeah, I'm quiet for the first time. <laughs> Not for long. It's the thing of, I guess, where it started. It's that thing that Matthew told you, like bringing out the gold of people. When I was a, when I was a first year student, um, I was just, I think I came in the first year around May, and I just connected with everyone. And I was just like going with my business. And then after one month, Matthew was like, ah, oh, you, should, you should join us on missions. I was like, okay, what's missions? I didn't even know what missions was. I only found out it's where you go there and it's like an annual thing and you evangelize to people. I didn't even know what evangelizing was. All I needed to do is I needed to go there. Um, so I was, I was in some sense like very, very impulsive. But then Matthew would then say to me, oh, Mr. Wilbert, you are a mighty man. <laughs> and I'm like, he doesn't know my anxiety, my fears and this little guy you know, this colored guy, skinny guy, why does he know about me that I'm a mighty man? But for some weird reason, he, he called upon something that I've been carrying all of my life, and I just knew to trust that, you know, it didn't account for my disability, but it accounted for my ability. And I, I, never, I never knew what it was. And um, I guess in terms of, like, building relationships and, like Pastor Lana said, I, I, I was shocked when you said that because I didn't know it was true. Um, but if I take, if I look now back, I see that there is a lot of like relationships that there's been facilitated to my intervening. But to be told, I was a Gideon, like when I first came to varsity, first year. I was so scared out of my mind. I was like, Ugh, what's happening? Like. I mean, I come from Friedendal, this small town, and I'm Cape Town, this big town, and what's happening? Like, like there's so many people here, different races, different colors, like, like people are from Congo, African. I'm like, what is happening? So, so I, ever since first year, I had, to, I had to deal with a lot of anxiety in terms of that, being so widespread and feeling like a, a fish in the ocean. And 
through, through courses like the School of the Nations, um, um, like also at the end of first year, there's been like one of the things that I really like about this church is they, they see you as an individual. They want you to grow in, in areas where you don't maybe think that you're fit to grow. That's why I asked Duncan, like, how did you overcome that, that thing? And then it's like to experience. And then School of the Nations taught me um, how, to, how to take authority. And then not authority, but just how to grow in, in your identity as being a son. And life went on. And then second year, it was a horrible year um, because I've been seeing in my life that small group will just flourish in. And I... And I felt like I didn't do anything. I just show up and then people will show up and then people will be happy. And there wasn't scripts being said or there wasn't like, inter like I, I didn't feel smart in a sense. I was just there in a the building and then people seemed to be there. And then I was always coming to Nyasa because he was my small group leader. I was like, how did I do? How did I do? And I'm like, I think I didn't touch on this and this. And he's like, man, look at the people that is coming. But there's, there, there seems like there's in my giddiness, in my anxiousness there, there was a sort of grace that God used to to bring people together and obviously it's something that you have to take responsibility of your anxiety I think single like obviously you like you build like a sort of tolerance effect towards your anxiety so you just go with the flow but you know it's there so like dire situations will expose it because if I would speak to a loud crowd I know this is what I'm called to do but I would like okay yeah yeah but I would just feel a lot of anxiety. And then School of Single Life Workshop last year, really, this year I mean, really did a good job on, on like going into those issues, like, you know, certain what like the route to, to, to my anxiety. And also like just like asking God some difficult questions because I feel like as though as, you know, like the life outside of me is flourishing. My, my personal life is like falling apart. Like I don't feel like I, I have what it takes to 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 um, like to facilitate even small group anymore because like I'm going the backwards, but small group outside of me like it's just going forward, and then people would see this guy, and I'm like, I don't see that in myself. So I I think single life workshop really helped me in a sense seeing that, not even sense seeing, but also like brought healing in a sense of like you 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 being healed, and then after that being healed and you got the necessary help that you got to have and also you have the necessary conversations that you were young yearning to have ever since you were a child um so i asked my my sister um like to to write me a letter like what was the like what was the what was i like growing up like what was the, what the type of guy was i and then she she told me like well but you know some people say you're very sensitive you're very like like caring and you too caring but that's that's not it it's like you you are actually very bold like y you see something when a situation is not right especially emotionally of the atmosphere isn't right you will do everything in your power to make sure that it is supposed to how it's supposed to be so i think through my experiences i'm not saying everyone has the same experience that i have but i think to a little extent is there like like there's a, even if, it, if I experience like 50% of anxiety, someone who might experience 2% of anxiety, I can connect with that 2% and then talking to that 2%, relating to that 2% and then almost like there's a connection point between these few, few people and then we will connect there and then as we work together, we see that, oh man, we have so much in common or oh, we don't have a lot in common, but we do agree on certain stuff and it also taught me how to listen to people empathetically and like see stuff the way they see stuff. Like um, the guy that I mentioned earlier, he was petty. And I didn't never know what petty was like growing up with him. I never know what I called music meant to him until I listened to it. And um, I felt like that really helped me in, because I knew myself now, I knew I have limitations. I knew I have certain fears. I'm aware of that. But I also knew now, you know, how God uses that limitation and to just create something like a Gideon out of it. So I like that verse of being Gideon and David and Elijah, where they have these episodes of just feeling depressed. They're like, ah, oh, I'm not going to make it. It just reminds me that there is hope. And it also 
allows me to connect to that vulnerability to other people because I believe that everyone, even though you're such an amazing man of God, there is some vulnerability in you. And that really helped me. Um, yeah, sorry, time. Oh, t- t- time? Okay, good. Okay, um, yeah, so I didn't know if I answered your question, but that was just me. One of the things that I think um, Wilbert was saying is self-awareness. His own self-awareness facilitates his ability to connect with other people. And, a, and also testimony. Um, especially when there were people whose current situation was the same as his past situation. So his testimony fit into their situation. And I think even if it's not an exact fit, it's universally true that your struggle can be resolved by God like my struggle was resolved by God. And I think what, what Wilbert was also mentioning was self-awareness. Okay, are there one of the students want to ask a question? Yes. Where's that mic? Thank you, Tian. Tian is new, by the way. Yeah, it's great. Um, thank you. So I wanted to ask before you pick us up. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, so something that I've noticed ever since I walked through the gates here is um, people's ability to just come come for you, you know? I think um, it's one of the values that we were talking about, um, how you have to be intentional and all of that. So I've, I'm, I've seen it, so yeah. Um, but anyway, I wanted to ask, how is it to approach a person and not know what their reaction is going to be? Because um, in my head, when, when a lot of people approached me the first time I, I got here, was what would happen if I was really mean, closed off, and I did not even accept the hello, hi, um, you know? So how do you approach a situation like that when people are really closed off and your spirit or the Holy Spirit tells you that, you know, that's the person you should really dig into? I think Gideon would start to arise now. <laughs> I'm joking. <laughs> Don't underestimate the power of your personality. Even if you are introverted or extroverted, doesn't matter. I believe I have more respect for introverted than I do for extroverted because introverted, I date an introverted girl, very introverted. And for the most half of our relationship, I talk her head off. <laughs> and then the last six months of being with her, I realized, wow, she actually got some interesting thoughts. Oh my goodness, look at that. Wow, did you think about that? (laughs) And I think, and I think, I think that helped. Like, like know what you can manage. Like, you know, if you are a person, because Cameron, she always tells me, even though I sometimes just push her, but she always tells me, one-on-one, I'm good with you. In a group, nah. And I didn't like that in the beginning because when we are one-on-one, she talks a lot. So then I will bring her in a group and then, why don't you talk that much? And then, you know, it's just like, it's her personality. So I, I believe that, that God has like endowed into us a personality to, to, to relate to other people. Like, don't underestimate your personality, even your background even. Like, use that, your upbringing, your grounding tactics, that's also a key. And everyone knows when they are loved. Even when you say something wrong, they still know whether you meant it well. Everyone in the world normally knows when someone's approaching them with love. So when you approach with love, even if you get a rejection, that's okay. Because it's not about you. Like, we're mature enough to take it. My identity does not depend on that person's reaction. I, God wanted me to love on them, and I did to the best that I can. Do you keep pushing if you really feel like you need to get your assignment done? On you them? follow the Holy Spirit. Okay. Yeah. So you always you always act in love. Yeah. What that person that you know like um, depends on what the Holy Spirit's leading you. That person must feel loved. Yeah. yeah. Yes, people know when you when they're a project. Yeah, yeah. and yeah. we so you always need. We don't naturally love everyone. I don't love someone I haven't seen unless I ask God. When I approach them, let me see them as you see them. Give me your love for them, and that's the supernatural part. 
Okay, I'm going to give to Megan. Um, and the question... Ah, oh, Tegelfatso. Okay, go Tegelfatso. Um, I guess my question is with regards to forming relationships with people in your small group. Like, what is the goal? Are you trying to be friends with them, or are you forming this bond, like this relationship with bonding with? Like, I'm your small group leader. See me as that, and like, if there are boundaries, what are they? How much of yourself do you share? How much of them do you want them to share? How does that dynamic work? Like, what's the goal of forming relationships? What is this relationship? Um, no, you need obviously need Holy Spirit wisdom is obviously assumed with all the answers. Yeah, <laughs> we can give you some. I can give you some practical. How I think about that is I think about how Jesus, how he saw his disciples. So he, he, Jesus had a small group. There was twelve people. One of them actually didn't make it. Um, wasn't a very good disciple. But at the end of the the end end of his. Um, so Jesus said, we're going to be better disciple makers than him, so we'll, we can do 12 out uh, But at, at the end of, of, of his ministry, he says, I've called you friends. So Jesus' go for me, the discipleship goal is always, it's, it's friendship. At the end, you, you will be, so it's not that you're going to be best friends with everyone in your small group, but you, but you will be friends with them, friends. We, in our small group, we're all friends. Um, some people are better friends than, uh, than other people. But friendship is always a goal for me of discipleship. And just on vulnerability, you must... I think that's what, well, what Wilbert is also sharing, is just building relationships. If you're not vulnerable, you're never going to be able to build relationships. Um, so you must share, you must be vulnerable. You must trust that it's spread out, vulnerable... You want to, you, you want to be. You're not gonna. There's, there's a. It, it depends. Um, but men, I think, always, always tend to be less vulnerable. So you could, men should be the status quo for men, or that just the, the normal way of, for men is to be let, to be, too not enough vulnerable. So we must be more vulnerable. Some other people, you must know your own personality. Maybe you're too vulnerable. And you're just throwing your pearls before swine, like Jesus said. So there's a, there's a, for me, I don't have a problem with being too vulnerable. I must rather be a little bit more vulnerable than I'm currently. I love what they did at Single Life Workshop where they said, um, you share what the Holy Spirit tells you to share, no more, no less. And you can do that in a small group. You say like, okay, so tonight we're talking about where in your life have you really been hurt? And then you say, but you share what you feel the Holy Spirit leads you to share, no more, no less. So you don't necessarily, you're not necessarily ready to put your most painful moment on the table. And we all know that that's okay. There's no expectation for you to do that. If you consistently see one person oversharing, that might need to be a conversation. And um, to call friendship is, there's so many different levels of friendship. And I have in the past said to someone, um, the kind of, like, I love you, and I want to invest in your life, but the kind of friendship that I think you're looking for is not what I can give right now. It's really hard to say that to someone, but it is love. And it's better you do that than you leave a misunderstanding. And what I've literally said to people, like, I can see you want that kind of friendship. Name two people, not me, two other people that you think you could have that with. And I'm going to pray with you. How are you going to start that friendship with them? I'm going to walk this journey with you. Ask them for coffee, they both say no, okay? Ask God if you should ask one again or if you should try someone else. I help someone make a friend than rather trying to always be the friend because especially in a student setup, uh, that can quickly go downhill. 
you can't be six people space marine. And it's best to be clear about that. But your, what Kenny saying, your care for them is real. You don't see them as projects. But the, what they have in their head and what you have in your head might not be the same. <laughs> and it's best to clear that up. I do want to give Megan an opportunity to speak about multiplication. Um, just some of the things in the survey, there, was, uh, there were quite a few questions about multiplication. Um, when, how, how do you know, how do you go about it? And a big one actually, and, and um, even mentioned today is, oh, we all love each other, so we don't really want to multiply. So they multiplied, and one of the multipli multiplied small groups are multiplying again. So I think the thing that I would also put on the table is like, did you multiply because you don't all love each other? Or is it possible to multiply when you all love each other? I'd like to say now that we've multiplied, we don't love the other people anymore. It's <laughs> over. It's over. Joking. I, r I really miss the others. <laughs> um, yeah, so just a bit of background. Um, yeah, so we, we had a small group that grew incredibly during lockdown. I mean, we came back from honeymoon, started a, a, a small group, and lockdown happened. And so we, some, of, some people we met on Zoom for the first time. It was during that time. And God just grew it. I, I don't know what happened, but it was amazing. And then we got to the point, um, yeah, we were, we were meeting together, and I mean, for one, like, we got to a place where we had, we obviously, everybody has more introverted, quite reserved people, and other people have, uh, and there are a lot of um, more outspoken and bold people. And we were getting to a point, firstly, where we had to kind of arrange our small groups or, or plan them to be able to make sure everybody gets a chance to talk and then you've got like a one line, you know, make, keep it short. That was like, it became that all the time we were saying, please keep it short, please keep it short. And there were times that um, uh, often the reserve people just, you know, weren't really coming out to say like, oh, shush everyone, I have something to say, you know. So you, you'd, you'd have to try and silence a lot of people. Um, and then there's others who have a lot to add and it was, super valuable stuff and you kept have to, having to say um, you know like give a chance to everybody or you know keep having to interrupt in that way and it just it was almost becoming it felt almost hurtful after a while to keep telling people to please you know kind of less or whatever it was just not nice um, our venue also we ended up always going over time um, and it just felt like we were becoming more of a, a, a kind of a burden which yeah so uh, it was very it was a difficult decision to make because we really loved everybody in the small group. We still love everybody. Um, and what happened was, oh, another part of it for me, because I really like one-on-one -on -one relationship. Um, and that's kind of more my focus. And I was finding that I could see there's a need, but I, I, can't, I can't get to that person. I can't have a coffee with that person because I've already got two coffees this week and next week and the week after kind of thing. Um, I just didn't have the capacity to meet with everybody. And I say me because uh, we had a lot of ladies. Um, so, yeah, so we started praying and we were like, it has to happen. And we started praying into it for it to go well. I think we prayed for the process as well. And then, um, fortunately, we had Danny and Angela, who were like amazing uh, in our small group and clear, clearly amazing leaders. And they were willing to, to take on the, the leadership of the new group. So yeah, we, we agreed with them. We prayed beforehand about how we were going to multiply, who would go to which group and that. We prayed by ourselves and then we got together and we sat and prayed together. And it was really cool. So just sort of the principles that we ended up following. I think it was, it was cool to have principles on how to put people in, in which groups. So the one f from me, I felt, I think Leona often talks about it, that God works through relationship. So I was like, okay, so how do the relationship connections work here? These two are very connected. Those two are very connected. I feel connected here. I can see Danny's connected there and Ange there. You know, that type of thing. That's how I approached it. And I think it was Danny um, that, that said that, like, a principle for her was that everyone should feel wanted. Where they go, they should be wanted. And, I mean, everybody was wanted in both. But... But sometimes we were just like, we saw reasons why they should be in both sides. Um, and, and we kind of had to work through that and pray through that. But um, yeah, it, it worked out very beautifully. Um, and then, sorry. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Yeah, um, and then we, we, I think the process of the handing over was also, we had one, we did, I think, tell everybody first and then have a meeting where we then kind of commissioned Danny and Ange 
they also prayed for us in our new small we both sort of prayed for both new small groups and it was it was cool it was a good end off i think and then um yeah kim shared about our first new smaller small group which was just like the holy spirit was like all over it and it was such a reassurance because i think we didn't really want to multiply but it was like the lord was like yes this is what i want um and yeah for, for us our small group has gone very deep um, we've definitely gone to depths, sort of, you know, dealing with things that we would, we really wouldn't have been able to do that if we were a bigger group. There's no way. Um, Danny's, uh, Danny and Angie's small group has now just multiplied again, so they, they've got like this growth, like so many people anointing. So it's, it's actually cool to see how the two different ones uh, multiplied or increased in different ways, like, like numbers and then like depth. It was interesting. Um, yeah, and I think in general, our our hesitance to, to multiply was kind of a few things. It was a sort of control, which came from like a fear of the unknown, I think. We were like, we're going to lose relationships. We don't know what it's going to look like on the other side. We really like what we have now. I, I can resonate with uh, we like what we have now. Didn't want to lose that dynamic. But, um, but I can see, we can see what God is doing now that, we, that we've done this. Um, and the comfort thing as well is like, I really love these people and having them around me and that. Um, but I, it's just, I was very challenged and we were challenged that it does, this doesn't belong to us. And if we, if we are building the kingdom, for me to be happy and like everyone around me, it's, it's, it must be secondary. It just belongs to Jesus. We give it back to Jesus. What does Jesus want to do here? Um, and f- when we felt that that was definitely multiplication. I still love you, Alpha and Rhee. She, she was in my small group. <laughs> Danny stole you. Hello? Okay. Um, oh, no, I forgot. Can I ask, where are the kids and are they okay? Because I can't hear them. Okay. <laughs> um, Good question. <laughs> uh, f- for all of the leaders, we human beings, We don't necessarily like everyone and we don't have control over who comes into our small group and who doesn't. Um, How do you deal with building a relationship with someone that really gets on your nerves? (laughs) Multiplication question. Sorry, it's just practically, I just want to know, did you decide to multiply once everybody consistently for like two months it was getting, it was so big? Mm. And just Yeah, so partly, partly that was the problem. We were seeing some people weren't coming. And I felt like, or we felt like, it, it, it's such a big crowd. People are like, I'm not going to be missed if I'm not there. And a lot of the time when you're a smaller group and there's only so many of you on the WhatsApp group, it's very evident when two of you consistently don't come and that kind of thing. So it's much more noticeable that you don't come when it's a smaller group. There's a psychology about how many people you can connect with. So the max is really eight. Um, Once a small group becomes more than eight, people can't keep more than seven other people's stories in their head at one time. So, um, and it gets too long for what you can reasonably handle. So one, the moment a small group is more than eight people, people won't come. It's not s- conscious, it's psychologically subconscious. That's why at the moment that you go to nine, you should multiply. Because four and five is a functional group. And I know sometimes the challenge is leadership, but Jesus has a leader. Yeah, um, mm-hmm. That's the psychology of it. Can, can I say something? So our group that then now uh, multiplied again, we didn't have time, I think, in there's just so many people came in that we didn't have time to, um, but to like dig into the, the really deep spaces. So I think, but then actually like to form the relationships, but there were these moments and these evenings of deep vulnerability and nobody knew each other. 
you know, and you just, it was, became this, and, and that was always when people were visiting. So there'd be like people who had visiting the church come into this space and people are like pouring their souls out in front of in, in these strangers. And, and those people would join in and we were just like, okay, but now we need to, we heard these stories and we've given a space for people to do that. But we need, there needs to be follow up to that. Like there does need to be structure to that because that's beautiful. But Ange and I, like we couldn't, I think maybe like 18 people, like in two months. Like, that's like not, it's not possible to facilitate like that in like long term. So it wasn't the same as like we were all connected and we loved each other. It was like, okay, it just has to happen. Yeah. So um, I was privileged to jump in with Megs and Johannes last year during lockdown. And so I've got to bear witness to some of that. But my question would be, the biblical mandate obviously then is for multiplication. So if we look at the Bible, we've seen that you know, God wants things to grow. He wants the kingdom to be fostered in for things to grow. Um, and I, I think like sometimes where I struggle is, in fact, I tend to see that, that that means that something needs there needs to be a process attached to that growth um, so my question would be like, uh, in your how, how did you how did the Holy Spirit align your desire um, for family and connection with um, his desire for growth like how, how heavily did you rely on the rely on the Holy Spirit? And how heavily did you rely on like systems and structures to maybe, yeah, see that multiplication happen? Um, just just joining the panel, just because uh, we are one. <laughs> um, it's it's very difficult because we really we we don't we don't want to leave it at friendship even. Like we want to create a trust relationship, and sometimes for that there are people that want to go deep, and sometimes people want to go on a surface level. So we always want to create that family. Like, in your family, you don't have to be best friends with your family member, but you trust them and you go deep. So, in that, there was a lot of difficulty, like serious difficulty for us to make that choice. But it's also our letting go and having, you know, giving the Lord the guide. Like, so, so he took us through a, a journey with that in communal living first. And then when we started realizing we're holding control... We're trying to make the decisions for God, and when we just let go and, and said, okay, God, what do you want to do? The first thing he said to us is, there are people that are falling away, multiply. And we didn't want to listen. Like Megan said at very high level, but she didn't focus. We really didn't want to listen. It took us weeks to really pray through it and really get there. We would say it and then just avoid the topic. And then say it again and just avoid the topic, and it would come from different places. Um, so, yeah, it's really just obedience. And then the process, like the physical process of it, was what she described. Like literally just praying and letting it happen. Letting go of that control. Yeah, I think it was all Holy Spirit led. The process itself, this, whatever structure or the way we decided to approach it was, Lord, how must we approach this? And then he kind of showed us what to do. So it might, yeah. that might also differ from yeah. one small group's multiplication to another, how, how you do it. Might. Yeah, sorry. So I just want to build this up. So, because my question, or um, the tension that I, I think is tough to hold, is deep roots and wide branches. It's like you can you can get people to go wide quite quickly if you give them some nutrients, and the tr the tree can shoot wide, you know, wide branches, and get people reaching out. You can see multiplication happen quite quickly, but in a way that's sustainable and won't see that tree fall over later down the road. I think that's the thing that's tricky to manage. So I'm just trying to dig more into that. Sorry, can I, I just think, like, the thing that really helped for us was, like, Ange and I are really close. So I think, like, in us being able to start a small group together, like, our intimacy and friendship with each other was what I think facilitated vulnerability in that space. You know, and, and how we cared for each other. Like, Ange and I have different strengths as, as people. And, um, and so where she is really, really strong is places where I sometimes drop the ball and vice versa. And because of that, I think that's what helped, like brought people in was because we, more, even more than I looked after the people in the small group, I felt like we looked after each other. And I think in that, I don't know, I think that was a big re help in, and reason for multiplication again. Okay, this is about multiplication, and then you can answer my first question. <laughs> um, so, and multiplication is natural, and, um, and that's something that we strive for. 
um, as Christians and as a church, but how can we as leaders avoid um, making members feel cast out? For example, I was part of a multiplication twice now, and I know God loves me, and I know that everyone here loves me, and I have um, personal relationships, but what if it's um, someone that's not as rooted, someone who who might be a little bit more, what's the right word? Yeah, on the fringe. A bit more fecal. So I think any um, multiplication is, you have to, it, it's not nothing. You have to think about what you're doing, pray about what you're doing, and, and connect with each person in your small group. So a multiplication is, and I mean, Megan said that. She said they spoke to every member of the small group before announcing it. So I don't think you should surprise your small group with a multiplication. <laughs> um, but a multiplication is one of those exceptional times where the leader should really have a good conversation with every single member. And of course, you'll know where the, those trigger points can be. And someone who would feel like that, it, there's something underlying that they could actually grow in. And you can use the multiplication process to trust the Lord to grow that person. It could be something like rejection prone. So there could be a rejection wound that the Lord wants to heal or that their identity is not in the right place. But that's something you could actually trust the Lord, identify it, support the person, but trust the Lord to actually be healed even through the process. I think you've got a very good process. Maybe you must write it down and send it as a template. We have a process for the church as well, you know. First worship and then sermon after that and then <laughs> altar call. <laughs> Holy Spirit can work in that. In, in, in the... Sorry, and I just think you're touching on something important. It's like the Holy Spirit is not bound by structures and systems, but actually when biblical or godly structures and systems are put in place and we discern the heart of God, we see more rapid multiplication and a better uh, holding together of the fruit of that or the harvest of that, right? So um, I think a part of our preparing process will look like managing that, like knowing that we are spirit-led, but then also knowing that God's given like a blueprint for us to actually do some cool things with. Uh, so Thanks, yeah. Megan and Tian. Ah, Kenny and Tian versus Megan. Can't remember your question, but I'll, I'll for any. I just want to say that that uh, poem you uh, read the other day was amazing, and I'm I can't believe the worship team haven't put it to a melody yet. I'm very disappointed actually. onion it's uh, it's you you so you obviously you must look at how Jesus sees him and and you will like and then you just focus on the things that you do like about it, the small things and you someone has said it yeah you just pray if you see that person do something you really like you just wow this is amazing and you praise them and you grow that thing and it grows it grows it's positive feedback also, there's like it's parenting and small group is very similar. So I look at my kids. There's things I don't like, and there's things I like, and I just I grow. I focus on those things I really like. Um, but God gives you a capacity to. There's lots of people that irritated me in my small group, and I, I'm, I've become good friends with them. And I've become, yeah, it's it's. Um, I think that's that's part of the challenge. God put those people, and then He thinks you can make a friend there. He thinks you can like them. He thinks you can love them. So it's it's part of that. It might not take um, love. It it might not be love at first sight, but it <laughs> can take. 
But everyone in, and the Holy Spirit, everyone makes the Holy Spirit makes people the odds of. It, I've seen it over and over and over. And it's sorry. Yeah, I think just uh, sorry, relationship before. questions is also. I like relationship questions. Um, <laughs> often. Firstly, can you, you buy yourself against Megan? Ah, back. Yes, of your area. Megan's a champion. Um, I think, secondly, uh, what I found is that the people that I'm most inclined to be opposite to or stand in opposition to, often those people have something that I don't, and that they're often a leader in a space that I'm not. Um, and so if you can close that gap um, in, in pursuing genuine relationships, you often, there's an impartation there of, of someone's, just someone's, there's a position of their heart that will actually give you access to others um, and different spaces that you previously were closed off to. Yes, and most importantly, you'll receive something in the spirit from your father that sees you then, so, your heart then soften in the long run to people in that space and actually see them as benefactors or benefactors to the kingdom picture rather than people that are detracting. Um, yeah, I don't know. That's just what I thought. Yeah, I just wanted to add to what Kenny said about, like, when you have to be someone you don't like, or just someone who just makes you feel weird. Um, I've always realized sometimes with people like that, it's maybe they have a similar trait to someone who hurt me in the past, or maybe, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I think, like, it always, like, is an opportunity where I'm like, why don't I like this person? Why are they making me feel like that? And to kind of figure out what's going on, like, in my heart. Yeah, with me, exactly. And then it's an opportunity to deal with those stuff, and then, like, to be intentional about, like, actually reaching out to that person because once I make that good connection it actually brings healing for myself as well so. um you I forgot my question <laughs> <laughs> oh okay sharp okay so I don't know who this is directed to it could be any one of the panelists yeah but like you know when you have to like make a like you pursuing a relationship with someone what happens if like let's say if they pushing you away when do you know when to stop because like do you carry on trying to like build a connection until the end of time or do you like have like a limit where you're like okay i've tried my best i've been reaching out to you every way possible when do you draw the line yeah, that's a good question, especially with something like follow-ups. So I think we have to get back to, I can control myself. I shouldn't be controlling someone else. So I give ample opportunity, and very much you need to be led by the Holy Spirit, but like I like to re-invite someone at least three times because I want to give ample opportunity, and then now it becomes harassment. <laughs> like, um, then, But I don't then just drop it. I make sure that, so this is a different kind of ball, but I make sure that they catch the ball. So I'm saying, listen, I completely uh, get that you couldn't come the last three weeks. You could totally come any week. Here is my number. You let me know when you want to come. So I never just stop contacting them or I just cut it off. I make very sure they understand. The invitation is open, but I'm not going to harass you. you know, so I'm, I'm taking control for me. I'm not taking control of you, but the door is wide open. And then you see when that person puts a step back in. But then saying that, all the time, the Holy Spirit reminds me of people who've fallen away. And I think about them, and I normally get a word for them, and I text them. Or sometimes a year later, I remember about someone. I'm like, that person has been gone for like a year. And I just get their number on the system, and I text them. And I say, do you want to come to church? So my first thing counts, but having said that, the Holy Spirit can always interrupt that and to be open to follow him. And it's happened to me sometimes that the Holy Spirit would tell me like, just don't give up with this person. Just go on for three months. And I'll just ask them every week. Danica?
Okay, I'm a, I am going to stop because we're already past time and I do want to honor just the time that we've set out. Um, maybe Kenny and Duncan, you guys can pray for us. No, it's just going to ask Danny if Karula paid a Uber trips. That's why she thought so. <laughs> Okay, let's, 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 I think everyone stand. Okay, so, so, um, just, just close your eyes and then, um, I want you to see your small group or whoever the group is that you're in charge of, maybe it's the kids' church or whatever. And then I just want to speak from the Lord's perspective. Um, the Lord tells you that He loves that group so much that He decided in His infinite wisdom, in His sovereign in His sovereign wisdom, that He's going to place you as their small group leader. Just think about what that means. Father, thank You that I can pray for that. Thank You that You empower everyone here with Your love and Your power and Your truth so that they can serve these people that you've placed under them or in their groups. Thank you that everyone here, they, they've got your love in them. They can love the people. And thank you that the people in their small groups, in their groups, will experience your love. They will, even if they don't see it, thank you that you're planting seeds through them that will prosper in the future. Thank you, Jesus, that right now I can pray that there's a supernatural anointing on them to really do the work, love the people in the small groups, and multiply it and bring the harvest in. We pray that in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Yes, Lord, we just uh, we thank you, Holy Spirit, that you are our helper, Lord, and um, <clears throat> that none of us has all the answers, and none of us know everything, Lord, but Holy Spirit, you do, and, and you, you are with us, and you want to help us, and so we just submit ourselves to you, God. Um, we pray that, that we would we just give ourselves as vessels to you, Lord, that Holy Spirit, you would work through us to that people in our small groups and those groups that we lead would see Jesus through us, Lord. And, um, yeah, we, I just pray a blessing over everyone, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that that um, that you honor them and you bless them for the sacrifice and, and the uh, the effort that they make, Lord. And we just pray for that blessing. We pray for for just open heavens that that they would hear your voice, they would connect with you so so clearly and so closely, Father. That that we can really be be the salt and the light in this world, Lord. And um, yeah, we just pray for for a multiplication of of these leaders of of this group, Lord. That that even next year that we meet, we be double as big, Father. And um, yeah, we just trust you, God. Thank you that we don't have to fear ever, and that you are the the Prince of Peace, Father. And,